Hi, and welcome to my channel. In today's video I'm going to talk about historical memory and how easily it can be twisted to achieve a political goal. Recently I visited the War Memorial of Korea, located in Seoul. The purpose of the institution is allegedly to educate future generations about the importance of peace by teaching them about past military conflicts in the Korean Peninsula. The museum hosts a highly educational exhibition about the history of warfare in Korea and displays a remarkable amount of items and military equipment, including tanks and warplanes. It is by all means a place worth visiting and I had a great time there. What's the deal then? The issue is that part of the museum dedicated to the Korean War represents the conflict in a very problematic way. In this video I am going to compare some of the disputable statements made in the memorial with the work of one of the most renowned scholars on the topic. Bruce Cummings has been the chair of the history department at the University of Chicago. He specialized in modern Korean history and published extensive works about the Korean War. Moreover, he was awarded a prize for his scholarly contribution to democracy, human rights and peace by Kim Dae-jung, former South Korean president and Nobel Peace Prize winner. For the aforementioned reasons, I believe he's a reliable source. Alright, let's get started. There is a general idea that the conflict between the two halves of the peninsula started with the unprovoked and long-planned invasion of the South by the North Korean military on the 25th of June 1950. This narrative is fully supported by the war memorial, although it is oversimplistic at best and willingly deceitful at worst. First of all, it's important to keep in mind that the hostilities were not started in June 1950 by an unprovoked act of aggression against a peaceful neighbor. Before the official start of the war, violent political unrest and bloody anti-communist repression had already claimed more than 100,000 victims in the South only. Moreover, border clashes between the two armies were a regular occurrence prior to the full-scale invasion from the North. Although the museum's explanation board tries to frame them as a provocation by Pyongyang's armed forces, internal American reports of the time state that most of the fighting along the 38th parallel was started by South Korean troops. And according to multiple accounts, the army of the Republic of Korea was both sizable and eager to attack, to the point that the US decided not to equip their Korean allies with heavy weaponry, fearing that they would have been used to invade the North. The eagerness of the South Korean leadership to cross the 38th parallel and reclaim the North is confirmed by contemporary Western sources. Moreover, Cummings states that the two adversaries had similar battle plans, an offensive to secure some positions close to the border and whose scope would have been changed according to the situation on the ground. In light of the aforementioned facts, it is dishonest to frame the start of the Korean War as an unprovoked act of aggression against a peaceful neighbor. It was rather the climax of an escalation, in which two belligerent parties were looking for the chance to strike a decisive blow against the other. Another rather disputable fact stated in the memorial is that the Republic of Korea's troops were trained mostly for police duties, while the DPRK had at its disposal a fearsome regular army. As I showed before, South Korea's armed forces were trained for battle, and equal in size to those of the North, even if they lacked the experience and heavy weaponry of their enemies. But even assuming that the Republic of Korea's military really acted as a police reserve, it's worth remembering that the national police at the time was mostly composed by officers who served under the Japanese colonial rule and deeply hated by the population for this very reason. If that wasn't enough, it shared its duties with far-right terrorist organizations and was prone to abuse its power by committing acts of appalling and undiscriminated violence, which often ended up in brutal massacres. All these embarrassing facts were not mentioned in the memorial, and as we are going to see in the next chapter, it is not a mere coincidence. What really caused my outrage, though, was reading this text. 
Although the memorial acknowledges the political violence in the South, it fails to address the structural causes that led to the revolts and the role played by the brutal state repression. For example, the Cheju uprising of 1948 was not the result of leftist agitators, but rather the consequence of deeply rooted social inequalities and the incompetence of government's officials. And what the museum calls pacify the conflicts in Cheju took the form of tens of thousands of dead and hundreds of burned villages in a display of undiscriminated violence that would make the Waffen SS proud. Furthermore, the memorial fails to mention that most of the civilian victims of the political violence were caused by the so-called pacifiers rather than by the communist guerrilla. And while North Korea had a minor role in the insurgencies, the US materially supported and organized the brutal repression in the South with the aim of making it as ruthless and effective as possible. The purpose of a war memorial should be to learn from the harsh lessons of a painful past to build a better future. But what can the Korean public learn from an institution whose primary goal is to glorify their armed forces rather than providing a fair and comprehensive account of their history? Erasing from the collective memory the hundreds of thousands of victims of South Korean forces is a despicable act. It turns uh, what should be an historical museum into a mere propaganda tool who serves the ego of the RRK military instead of educating its citizens. Having a deep and nuanced understanding of the events that led to the Korean War and acknowledge all its victims is a necessary step to build a real and lasting peace in the Korean Peninsula and maybe lay the basis for a peaceful unification of a people that far too long has been separated by the scars of the Korean War. And that was all. If you are still watching at this point, I thank you for your attention. If you found the video interesting, like, subscribe or send a feedback in the comments. If you didn't like it, please let me know why. A big thank you to Sangyan for making this video possible. See you next time!